The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven will be as when a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? And you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Can you bow your heads with me in prayer? Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day that you have created and allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them? Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus? Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. You know that feeling when you put on brand new socks or when you get into a nice hot tub or when you pop a pimple? That's how I felt when that sound went off. Thank you, Steve and team in the back of the house. Uh, just a reminder, Paul tells you today, uh, of course, in reference to the second coming, but uh, he does say, keep awake. So if this goes long, he said, do not sleep. So I'm just giving you fair warning. I will try to keep it up tempo. Today, I'd like to begin with a reading from one of my favorite uh, theologians, writers, C.S. Lewis, from his book, Mere Christianity, which I quote a couple times a year. I've quoted some of this before, probably four or five years ago, but it bears on our parable today. This is from chapter 10 of Mere Christianity. Niceness, wholesome, integrated personality is an excellent thing. We must try by every medical, educational, economic, and political means in our power to produce a world where as many people as possible grow up nice. Just as we must try to produce a world where all have plenty to eat. But we must not suppose that even if we succeeded in making everyone nice, we should have saved their souls. A world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world and might even be more difficult to save. For mere improvement is not redemption. Though redemption always improves people even here and now and will, in the end, improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine, God became man to turn creatures into sons and daughters, not simply to produce better people of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of person, it's not like teaching a horse to jump better and better and better, but like turning a horse into a winged creature. Of course, once it has got its wings, it will soar over fences which could never have been jumped and thus beat the natural horse at its own game. 
but there may be a period while the wings are just beginning to grow when it cannot do so. And that at stage, the lumps on the shoulders, no one could tell by looking at them that they are going to be wings, may give it an awkward appearance. So what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about two things, I think. One, he's saying that his job in coming to us in Christ is not to make us nice. It's okay to be nice, it's good to be nice, but that's not what God is doing. He is making us new creatures. He is making us holy creatures. He is making us saints. That's different than just being nice. Which means, the second point, when we go out into the world, as a faithful Christian, your job is, yes, to be nice, but that's not actually what you're called, called to do. Being nice to people isn't so much a Christian thing. As he even points out, anybody can be nice. That's not our job. Our job is not only to be holy, but to act holy in the world. That means to forgive all people. That means to be merciful to all people. That means to love all people. All people. Your neighbors, your friends, and, say it with me, your enemies. That's not being nice. That's being holy. It's a whole different ball game. He continues in the next chapter talking about teasing out this idea of what the creature is called to. And he says this. The command, be ye perfect, is not idealistic gas, nor is a command to do the impossible. He is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command. He said in scripture that we were gods, and he is going to make good his words. If we let him, for we can prevent him if we choose. He will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a god or goddess. A dazzling, radiant, immortal creature pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom as love as we cannot now imagine. A bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long, and in parts very painful, but that's what we're in for. Nothing less. He meant what he said. And then I wrote some words, which I usually don't do, but I didn't want to mess it up, so I have it written. So these are my summary. Today in our parable, and even last week in the parable of the bridesmaids, we see the lives of those new winged creatures being made perfect in God's image. We see the holy, perfect work they are called to and invited to, in the image of the bridesmaids and the servants today, those who have prepared, those who are serving, those who make use of the gifts and talents that God has given them. But we also see images of those who've decided to not make use of the wings and the perfection and the godlikeness that Christ has offered us in our faith. We see stories of those who have squandered their gifts. Today's parable is more a warning and a reminder for those of us who may have neglected our wings, our gifts, and begun to lose them. But in the end, it is also a reminder, a call of hope and encouragement to keep up the good works that God has called us to. So what's going on in this parable and how does it relate to those good works? We see an amazing story today as the servant and the master come together. And this, of course, is Jesus and his followers. And we see a, a kind of a list of things that he does with his servants. First off, he's about to go away. This is, just like last week, the kind of second coming preparation. He's giving us something and then he's going away. And what does he give? He gives these talents. Well, the talents at the time were a weight of measurement of finance. But that word, the way you hear it, the way I hear it, is the anglicized, Latinized version of taking the word in Greek and saying it's a gift. So the talents and skills we have are indirectly related to this parable, actually. And so God gives to those who follow him. Now, he gives according to ability. He doesn't give all of us the same amount because we all can't carry the same amount. So you notice, he gives some five, some two, some one. That's a moment of grace. He recognizes some of us are built and created in different ways, and so he gives accordingly to our ability. And then as he prepares to go off, he expects something. 
He expects that we will take the gifts that he has given us and we will make use of them. (gasps) How dare he? And so you see what happens is not only does he expect them to make use of them, what happens with these talents is they begin to grow and multiply when used. So the five become ten. The two become four. It's amazing. When we use our gifts and skills that God has given us, things grow and expand and multiply. Then something happens that we may not really enjoy often. You see when he comes back and he starts talking to them, what does he say? Look at what you have done. Look at the multiplication and growth. Now I'm going to give you more responsibility. I have to do more? But then he says, hey, enter into my joy. Come celebrate what you have done for my kingdom with the gifts as you, that winged creature, fly in the love that I have given you to share with the world. It's a beautiful image. And then there's the other one. This one who has done nothing with his talent. In fact, he went and buried it. Didn't use it, didn't multiply, did nothing. And you see what happens to him. We'll get into the details a little later, but what happens to the one who did nothing? Go on your way. (laughs) Not nicely. Go into the darkness and that weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, whenever I hear that passage, I think of nails on a chalkboard, which I literally cannot stand. That's what happens to the one who does nothing with the gifts that God has given him. Now, underlying both of these images of those who have and those who have not is a concept that we need to be, I think, a little bit more aware of. You've heard of the phrase good works, probably. Good works is a scriptural kind of teaching of when God has given us the gifts. What we do with them are good works. They're meant to be good because God has given us the ability to do them. And the whole kind of historical interpretation for us as Episcopalians out of the Anglican Church, which is the Church of England, I hope you all know this general history. Back to Henry VIII, the Reformation, right? You all took classes yesterday. 1500s. There was this schism... The Protestant Reformation. Basically, one of the main things they were doing is saying the Catholic Church in general, there were some good things, but this is one of the things they were doing. They were saying, look, you can do things to get entrance into salvation. If you do these things, and if you give this money, God will welcome you in. And the Protestants were studying Scripture, and they're like, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. Luther comes out with his classic statement. Do you remember this one? We are justified by what? Faith and faith alone. And what does that mean? Justified, well, it's a legal term. We are justified by our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And what that means is what Jesus did on the cross justifies us. That means we are just, righteous before God's eyes. What it means is God looks at us as sinners and recognizes that we are guilty, but because of what Jesus has done, you are actually innocent in God's eyes. And so you are justified The door is open, and you are welcomed back into reconciliation with God. That's what it means to be justified by your faith. Notice I didn't talk about any of you doing anything except having faith. And notice I didn't say anything about good works yet. Faith opens the door. So there's a second step. Justification is followed by, and many of you may remember this term, sanctification, sanctifying, saint holiness, set aside for God's, remember, work. The process, once you have had the door open, you remember, in baptism, in our faith, we are taught, and Jesus shows us, and Paul shows us, that the Holy Spirit comes in, and he starts cleaning up. He's like a cleaning crew. And when we allow him to work in our lives, when we take the gifts he has given us, these are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we begin doing what? Good works. You notice how the good works didn't come first? No, the faith came first, then the good works. You notice who's pushing both buttons? Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so this image of good works was a pushback against, I'm trying to get into heaven. I got to do things, which we all subconsciously think, which is why we need to be reminded. I, multiple times a year, have people say to me, probably because I'm the pastor, Oh, I'm doing this little thing. Could I help out over here? Because I'm really trying to get in with the big guy. No. No. 
You don't have to do that to get reconciliation with God. In fact, you can't do that. You can't reconcile with the infinite loving God. God had to do that. That's why Jesus was God and man, because he has to unite the two. He's the only one who can open the door because it's his door. Your effort to please God doesn't really matter in the acts of salvation. He's already done that. That's why it's called grace. Undeserving and yet welcomed into the party. However, once we have the door open, God says, I'm going to move in. And in the idea of the talents, in the idea last week of the bridesmaid who are preparing, there is some expected work because, look, I've given you these gifts. I really trust that you will use them. And so we have two conflicting statements. Many people, as those who come to me, and sometimes I think they're joking, sometimes serious, who say, I'm trying to do this to get up there. The idea is that these good works that we do merit our favor, that they're making God see us and say, okay, he can get in. No. As one theologian put it, the good works are really actions of love used to propel the work of the kingdom for God's people and for his glory. You see the difference? The works don't get us to God. The works help us propel God's kingdom. It's totally different. You are open in the door because of what you have believed, and then God says, join me in the work. Join me in this kingdom. You've said yes, so let's get to work. These are the good works. Unfortunately, sometimes people don't get involved in the work. And you can see how they are acting. You see the bridesmaids who didn't prepare. And what happens? Sorry, you're not allowed to come into the party. No joy celebration for you. You can see today what happens. Cast out into darkness. But you can see multiple examples of this. This is why this is not like, oh, Jesus just said that once or twice. He says it across the board. Think about some of the other issues, the stories. Do you remember the parable of the sower? Do you remember that? Four seeds. Do you remember how many grew? One. What happened to the other seeds of faith? that were supposed to grow. Do you remember? One of them barely grew at all and then died off. Another one started growing and got choked. The other one grew up and burned up. Burned up. What happens when you burn something? It turns into what? Nothing. Do you remember the story of the fig tree? Two different versions. One, he grows and what's on the fig tree? Uh-oh. Remember this one? There's no fruit. What do you do with a tree with no fruit? Cut it down. Or... You burn it. What happens to a tree that is cut down? What happens when you burn a tree? It is literally, by definition, useless. Now, when you hear me using these terms, don't mishear me. This is not a sign of a mean, vengeful God who is saying, you didn't do what I tell you. Because that's what the third servant today emotes. You see how he reacts. God has come, this merciful master who has given gifts to his servants and said, I trust that you will do something with it. It's a great gift. The third servant, huh, you hear what he does? Uh, well, I know you didn't do any work and you're just going to make me do work and then you're going to take all the proceeds. Slander and excuses. Psh, I don't have to do it. So what did I do? I just buried it. I was afraid of you. What happens when we're afraid? freeze up. We can't do anything. There's no action. And so what happens? Okay, see ya. You don't want to be involved, so go out. That's not a mean and vengeful God. That's actually a God of perfect justice. By definition, what Jesus is saying is when you have been given the gift of eternal life, and welcome to come help love other people. Because don't we always say that? I want to love people. How do we do that? All the gifts that God has given us. When we don't do any of that, God's like, you didn't want to join in. So by definition, what are we? Useless. Nothing. Not because he doesn't still love you, because he didn't, you didn't want to be a part of it. We made the choice. As he says, we can prevent God from blessing us and sanctifying us by doing what? I'm good. That's the story. 
Today, this imagery reminds us that those who do nothing become nothing. Not because God doesn't love them, but because they chose not to get involved in the kingdom. There was no movement of love. There was, as I always do, the Gollum moment. One ring to rule them all, my precious. Gollum would have done nothing. He did nothing. He sat in a darkened cave and just looked at his ring. What did the hobbits do? They traversed the entire continent, gave up their lives almost to save the world. Do you see the difference? And so today we're reminded that God has given us these gifts. He has transformed us into these beautiful, wonderful creatures. This litany that, that C.S. Lewis gives us today, he will make the feeblest and the filthiest of us into a god or a goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature pulsating through with energy and joy and wisdom of love as we cannot imagine. Really? Whew, that's good stuff. How could you not want to be a part of that? This is what astounds me when I hear of people who say, oh, I believe in Jesus. What are you doing about it? Well, I'm nice to my neighbors. Really? What does that mean? You said hi, you weren't mean to them, and you didn't bother them about anything? You let them go on their way? Is that what beads night? We're not called to be nice. That's the beginning of the reading I gave. We're called to be holy. We're called to be new creatures. We're called to the good works of faith. Paul and James and Jesus talk about that. Do you know the James, the classic quote, right? Faith without works is dead. Again, you don't do the works first. It comes out of the faith. And if you need one more image, think about 1 Corinthians 13. Everybody knows that. You've all been to at least 47 weddings. Remember the love passage? Do you remember how it begins? Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I am what? Nothing. Not because God doesn't love me, not because he hasn't given me gifts, but because I have decided to do nothing with the love he has given me. And so, nothing. We judge ourselves. John says this in chapter 20. He says, we have judged ourselves guilty because we didn't want what God has offered us, even though we said yes. So, into the darkness, not allowed to the party, cut down, burned up. This is Jesus' way of saying, I have given you great opportunity. And when you don't want to be a part of it, you have decided by yourself to be cast out. I want to finish with some beautiful words from one of my favorite theologians, Alexander McLaren, as he talks about uh, these dark moments um, that keep us frozen. This third servant who was afraid, who made excuses, who was slanderous and slothful, and what should be its opposite. This is in his chapter on the buried talent. Love moves to action. Fear paralyzes into indolence, laziness, slothfulness. And the reason why so many do nothing for God is because their hearts have never been touched with a thorough conviction that he has done everything for them. Just a pause there. Nothing. Literally 0.0, .0 for infinity that you have is actually yours. All of it is because of God. He has done everything for them, and he asks but to love him back again and bring your heart to him. These dark thoughts are like the frost which binds the ground in iron fetters, making all the little flowers that were beginning to push their heads into light shrink back again. And love, when it comes, will come like the west wind and the sunshine of the spring. And before its emancipating fingers, the earth fetters will be cast aside and the white snowdrops and the yellow crocuses will show themselves above the ground. If you want your hearts to bear any fruit of noble living and holy consecration and pure deeds, then here is the process. Begin with the knowledge and the belief of the love which God has given us. Learn that at the cross. And then let it silence your doubts and send them back to the kennels, silenced. Then take the next step and love him back again. We love him because he first loved us. That love will be the productive principle of all glad obedience and you will keep his commandments and here upon earth find as the faithful servants found, 
the talents that are used increase. And yonder will receive the words from his lips to whom to please is blessedness, by whom to be praised is heaven's glory. Well done, good and faithful servant. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.